This epitaph to Claudia was found in Rome uh, and has been dated by reference to spellings and its letter forms and the monument itself, I imagine, to about 150 BCE. So it's uh, earlier than the other Latin that you are looking at uh, it, for this exam and therefore some of its spellings have been changed to make them recognisable for you. It is evident that this would have been placed on a monument to a dead woman uh, along a road leading out of Rome. Because of the ritual pollution, the miasma, which the Romans associated uh, with death and the dead, um, uh, tombs were placed outside the city walls and gates and they were placed alongside the road I think initially for convenience it's just easy to bury people alongside the road but then uh, people monumentalize them once um, images and writing uh, come in and so that they can become um, a kind of advertisement for the deceased and the deceased's family and once writing comes in and there aren't just pictures we get the idea of um, that you can read and find out about the deceased. You can perhaps also find out about their family if they are, if the tombs are put in a family grouping, you can see how everyone is related to everyone else and you can really emphasize your familial wealth. Um, and you can, if you have enough money to pay for a poem to be written, as in this case, and for a poem uh, not just to be composed, written in that sense, but also inscribed on the stone, um, you can show what that person has done in their life. Now for a female whose duty is centred around the home, it is not unsurprising that what she has will have done is generally associated with the role of herself as the, if she's lived long enough to get married and have children, as, as a matrona. And so what we see in these inscriptions is an idealisation of what an individual woman has done so that she has become a credit to her family, both the family that brought her up, what we might call her natal family, the one which uh, raised her, uh, and then uh, the one into which she married, the marital family. And you might have a little think about the Pliny letter here to Calponia Hispula, where the credit is given to the aunt for having raised the female in such a way that she becomes a good wife. And it's interesting on this monument that her parents are, are mentioned, not by name, but in their duty that they have as uh, giving her a name. Uh, so that um, there's also, you know, there's some credit there. Yeah, you know, they were good parents and she became a good wife. So let's have a look at what is eulogised, what is praised in this epitaph. The praise starts in the second line, but the first line is an informal address to the stranger, a stranger passing by, the hospice, uh, and the, the stranger is asked to asta to stand, stand still, and per lege, read thoroughly the pair at the beginning of this word means to do something thoroughly to so it's to read through something don't just look at the name read it through um, and then the little bit in the middle quad deco paulum s is the kind of thing that someone says to you you know when they stop you in the street and try and get you to buy something i'm not going to take long over this quad deco paulum s what i say is little so the deco is the inscription or the monument, it's the, it's, it's the voice of the inscription, and the hospice is the reader. So, in your case, that's you. So, hikes sepulchrum pulchrum. Um, this is a pulchrum, a beautiful sepulchrum tomb, and then we've got the word howled, nasty little word howled, because it's a negative, but it doesn't look, doesn't begin with N, so it doesn't look like a negative. This is a not beautiful tomb, and then genitives, pulchri femini, of a beautiful woman. So we've got a chiasmus here, an A, B, B, A, noun, sepulchrum, adjective, pulchrum, adjective, pulchri, noun, 
Femini. So a little bit of a literary effect here. Um, there are lots of those in, in the other poems that we're looking at. And indeed the speech that were the letters and speeches that we're looking at. Um, and it just shows there's a little literary flourish to this. But the first thing I want to say is, you know, there's a mock modesty. It's not a very beautiful tomb. But the woman was beautiful. And so the first thing that's important about a, a Roman woman uh, here is maybe her, her physicality. So little has changed there. So, you know, it's how you look. That's how women get judged. Second line, third line rather, her parents named her the name Claudia. So her parents, unnamed, but they gave her the name is probably a better translation, but look at the polyptoton, the playing around with the word to nominare, to give a name, and nome in the word name. So words that are cognate, that are clearly related. And that emphasises the fact that the message they want to get is her name. Her name, and that's the first word, nomen, and then the last word, Claudia, in both emphatic positions. So her name, Claudia, there in the, the accusative, uh, is bump, bang, placed for you, balanced at the beginning and the end of the line, nomen, Claudia. OK, so we know her name, and I think probably there were other monuments around this that gave you more uh, citizen names so you could figure out which family she either married into or was born into. Claudia is uh, quite a nice uh, aristocratic name. Um, so uh, I think she's from a good wealthy family. So what else do we know about her? We know that she, as the translation tells us, she loved her husband with her heart. Uh, Dilexit sua maritum. She loved her husband, suo corde, which is operative, with her own heart. And here, to get that idea in, they've got with all her heart. And that's really emphasising how much she loved him by putting the corde suo around the verb there, separating the suo from the corde. So Roman marriage was not primarily about love. It was... Uh, a, very often, especially for wealthier families, an agreement between families to exchange monies, properties, and to join together with the hope of having common heirs uh, in the children produced from that marriage. Uh, and, and, and love was a bonus. Um, and it looks like by the end of this marriage, she really loved him. Um, uh, or at least that's what's put there. And she doesn't get to say anything, does she? Someone else has written this for her, we imagine. Uh, so, you know, the woman, nameless in so many sources uh, and voiceless in, in so many sources, she gets a name here, but she still doesn't get a voice, but she at least loves him, which, um, do you remember the bit in the Pliny letter to Calpurnia, uh, his bulla, where he says, oh, she actually loves me. So remember those two to go together. Marriage isn't the deal for about love. You don't have to have love in a marriage. That's a bonus. Pliny talks about that as a bonus, and I think we're getting that here too. So she was beautiful, and she uh, loved her husband, and then bang, she did the really great thing. She gave him two sons. Look at the uh, position of Natos. Uh, and duos is actually an emphatic position here as well because it's an, a, a, an adjective of quantity and that should go before its noun but it's following its noun so it's uh, kind of emphasized here uh, natos is a word that is is common in gender i can make it natas and that would be uh, female creatures that she gave birth to so daughters here the masculine form of it uh, is son so sons are always going to be uh, more wanted in the ancient world, both Greece and Rome, their daughters, because uh, they carry on uh, family cults, they fam carry on family business, uh, political alliances, and they also inherit the money. And when they marry, they will bring money into a family. So she did really well here. Now, Hora Maltram, of these uh, two, she left one on the earth, in terror. Be careful here, the in doesn't mean in the earth. This one isn't dead, this one means on the earth. In plus the ablative can be in or on, and that's what that is here. 
and the other one is placed or she placed the other one under the earth so you know what happens in the ancient world mortality rates for children are high so she created two sons but one of them is still living well that's a win but the other one she had to bury which is a tragedy but it's not an unusual tragedy in the ancient world uh, because mortality rates are anything between a fifth to a third especially up to about the age of four or five uh, notice i kind of try to highlight the uh, the balancing of in terra and sub terra liquid with locat look they both begin with liquid sounds l's liquid sounds you've got the alterum and the allium there um, from two uh, different words alter alter altera alterum and uh, alius arum uh, but they are cognate they are related but just a little bit of variation variatio there in those two words so she the she was beautiful she loved her husband she gave him two sons and she went through the uh, unfortunate experience, but not uncommon experience, of burying one of them. Then what else do we have? She's Sermone Lepido. She's with light or charming conversation and, uh, and indeed, and then indeed, Tum Autem, in Kesu Komodo, uh, an elegant step. So she could make polite conversation when she was asked to and she was light on her feet she didn't stomp around the house making a hell of a lot of noise so she was a very good accessory for a husband in a household she could talk when she was asked to with charming speech and uh, and notice there's nothing about the content of it in the sense of you know is there any intellectual heft to this maybe not and she's light on her feet, so she's elegant. And she uh, served with the domum. She looked after the household here, so her job would be to control the slaves, making sure that work was done, duties were carried out, and that uh, money and um, possessions weren't stolen. So she looked after uh, the household as a good mistress of the household. She lanam fake it. She made wool, so she worked wool. She span. She spun wool into thread the lanam fake it now this is a trope going all the way back to penelope in the odyssey who sits for 20 years waiting for odysseus uh, to come back weaving away and not uh, paying any attention to her many many suitors so uh, one of the ways in fact in which a woman brings money into a household if it's a lower class household is by transferring um, or transforming uh, a raw product raw wool into thread and then perhaps weaving it um, uh, into textiles which can be sold it's very unlikely that this woman did anything like that but the female slaves would be expected to do that and she would model that also the emperor augustus famously uh, wore homespun clothes made by the empress livia it was a move by augustus this is in the, the sort of turn of um the end of the first century BC, up to his death in 14 AD, the Emperor Livia, Empress Livia is pre shown as a, a model of what a good housewife should be. There's been a breakdown of morals, breakdown of households in the civil wars, and it's interesting that um, one of the things that Augustus tries to do is to put everything back on a good footing uh, amongst the loads of uh, other legislation is to try and model that a good upper-class wife works wool. So Lanam Fekit goes through all the way from the 8th, 9th century BC with the myth of uh, Odysseus and the Odyssey, or it's probably before that now, um, uh, all the way up to the second, uh, sorry, the 1st century AD with women working wool. And then we go back to the first person singular, Dixie. I have spoken um, a nice little perfect. In other words, everything's finished. The I being the, the, the eulogy, the gravestone. Um, has spoken and then another imperative from Ao, I go and we've got ab in front of that which means away and that means go away so that's another command so a very short uh, command at the end as uh, promised in the opening lines of this piece 
So as you think about this uh, little uh, eulogy, you want to think about what is being emphasised, what's being left out, how that will reflect on her natal family, the family she was born into, her marital family, the family in which, into which she marries. Do you believe all of it? Why are these things chosen? And how do you react to these in the 21st century as a reader? Um, and we might think about gender roles and the way that they are placed in front of us in the media and the extent to which we might rebel against them, we might reject them, or we might try to imitate them and we might see them as aspirational. So, an important and, I must say, linguistically easy little piece of writing here. Have a good think about it. It's the one bit of um, everyday Latin that you get in these set texts. So don't forget to use it and make reference to it, especially if it doesn't come up as a set text in the essay um, uh, question, or if we get one of the tombs coming up in the... Um, photo question, don't forget to mention this either.